It was so stupid, bruv. Mm. Like, I remember being with, with high, the evil face, uh, Trace and Fair, and it was raining outside. Mm. And we got down to Kilburn Park, and I saw my guy Hyde, like, rubbing the soles of his trainers on the floor. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, it's been raining outside. If we step on the tracks, we'll get electrocuted. So I'm just taking the water off. <laughs> You know, oh. and then we'd go and cross the tracks and it was the biggest buzz, but it was obviously like really, really silly thing to do and we were, we were 12 years old. But I remember going home that day, man, and my mum obviously knew that this was my mate who mm. died. The Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official .com. <laughs> You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Oh, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, Killer God. Keller Podcast, live and direct. Central is you know where, for you know what. You don't want to be anywhere else. London it is. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight to everyone sharing and caring, all right? We're caring, doing, I like that. Caring. We don't Care. do this for our health over here. We're doing it proper for one reason only, and that is the spread of information. Um, if you've got the television app, you know what to do. Listen, inside the place, you're hearing the sultry voice of a man that not only is a overqualified radio DJ and expert on the turntables, ah. 26 to 30-something years on with mixtapes on the streets, Dizzy Rascal, Roots Maneuver, Ninja Tune, Playhouse, I think, we connected one time. Was, uh, listen... DJ MK on, inside bro? the flag. What's going on, man? What's I've got to on? add as well, graffiti, ex graffiti writer as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I got into hip hop, really. It's how you got into hip hop. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where the trouble began. That's when the trouble began. <laughs> All the joys of my life. Yes, exactly. Yeah, a man. blessing and a curse are these things of hip hop, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. For me, it kind of was a blessing and a curse, definitely. Uh, but yeah, it's something that, that I loved and. Yeah, obviously I love Graf, man. That's how I got. Mm. That's how I got into to hip hop. We're, we're recording this in Northwest London, mm. where I literally grew up a mile down the road. So I was born in Harleston, grew up like Neasden, Wembley, Cricklewood, Kilburn, those kind of areas. What was it like back in the... See, we're jumping straight. You know we ain't messing around here when we get into these conversations. We've got legacy holders inside the place. Um, DJ MK, if you do not know, and you're outside of the, the UK in some sort... In fact, outside the world, because this man tours like a motherfucker. Um, in fact, the last time I tried to connect him, he was in Australia or something. This man does not fuck about... You know, we're talking about lineage here, but it all started in, in Northwest, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. Like, I, as a kid growing up, I was always one of those kids who'd always be inquisitive. I'd always be asking questions. And I remember back in the day, Brent used to do this thing for the kids in the area where they'd give you free swimming lessons every Thursday in, in Wilson Sports Centre. So I was living in Easton at the time. So every Thursday, my mum would drive me and all my cousins uh, down Duddenhill Lane into, into to, to Wilson. And I remember going over Duddenhill Lane... There's a big bridge, mm. and this is before Graf. This is probably like, I don't know, man, like 1980, something like that. Whoa. And I'd, I'd notice like these political slogans. So mm. it'd say stuff like, and it'd be all, all be left over from the 60s. It'd be like, ban the bomb, hands off Vietnam. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. yeah, Radio Caroline forever. And I remember saying to my mum, like, Radio Caroline. Yeah, like, <gasps> like Radio Caroline. Like, why has someone written that? And they've gone, my mum's gone, ah, oh, because, you know, Radio Caroline was a, a pirate radio mm. station. I'm like, what's pirate radio? She's like, oh, well, when we were little, we wanted to listen to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, but Radio 1 wasn't playing it, so, so we'd cool. listen to Radio Caroline. So I'm like six, learning about pirate radio. Yeah. And going to my mum, so is that illegal? Are you allowed to, to mm. write on the walls? No, 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 that's illegal. So then I'm just seeing all these, like, slogans, thinking, why, one, why did someone write that? <laughs> And two, what was going on in their head? Like, they must have really wanted to get their point across, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get, I mean, there's no spray cans then, really, to get a paintbrush. And actually do the job. And, 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 yeah. and, and, and to paint. Uh, but then, like, 
getting a bit older, you'd start to see random pieces that might say fresh or hip hop. Mm. So I remember to go to school, I'd have to go down Neeson Lane in NW10. And where the McDonald's is there, there's the River Brent goes underneath. Yeah. And that was the very first piece I ever saw. must have been like 1983. And on one side, it just said fresh. And then on the other side of the road where the bridge was, it said hip hop. And that just used to amaze me. I used to be like, what is that? Mm. And then you'd slowly piece it together. So then you'd be watching Top of the Pops. Mm. Top of the Pops. And then like Buffalo Girls, Malcolm McLaren would come on. And then you'd see the video to that. And you'd see, oh, that's that piece that I saw. It's like that. Okay, so this is hip hop. Okay. Wow. And then electro music's coming mm. in. And you're like, okay, so this is like the music for it. And then mm. like the electro compilations and stuff. And then obviously... 84, 85, we get Subway Art, uh, you know. And then 86, I start going to secondary school. So I was supposed to go to secondary school round here, down in Harleston, right? Mm -hmm. So I was living in Wembley at the time. So if I was to go to that school, I'd have to get the 18 bus there, right? Right. Which from Wembley to, to Harleston would take you about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it'd be quite a boring journey and you're not really seeing much graph apart from like some what's on the bus or whatever. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But I didn't go to that school. I got, I went to another school in like Holland Park, Shepherd's Bush area. So now rather than just taking the bus to school, I had to take the big Met. <laughs> so from September 86, and by this time now, we've got spray can Bubbling, art. yeah. So with spray can art, we could see what was going on in Wolverhampton. Mm. We could see what was going on in Bristol. Okay, there's a writer called Goldie. And I was like, yeah, I've seen this guy before. Oh, he's sick. You know, Chrome Angels, Shades, yeah. writers like that. Come on. You know, and then, and that's that's how I got into hip hop, man. And then the minute I went to secondary school and I was getting on the Big Met every day, that just opened my world, my eyes to a world of, of, of graph and art. And at that time, the Big Met was just getting battered. Mm. So like, I'm from, from, from Wembley, really. So at that time, as a writer, the first writer that I really looked up to, and I was like, this guy's all city. He's incredible. Sir Bo. Sir Bo. Whoa. Sir Bo, yeah, CD, yeah, 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 rest yeah, yeah, yeah. in peace, rest in peace, Old Sir Bo. Tight, yep. And he lived a street away from me, and he went to school with my cousin. And uh, this guy... What? Was... That's bonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, like, and I used to live near King Edward's Park in Wembley. So if you, if I jumped over the fence of my garden, I'd be in the park. And there was a Sir Bo piece and his brother a sign. And this is, like, 86, 87. This I... is early, early, early. Yeah, and I was just like, Ross, I'm getting on the Big Met every day. I'm just seeing you know, Kiss 42, Coma, mm. CD, mm. Set 3, Buff 1, Tilt. Yes, I. Yeah. All these guys and early sort of pieces, you know. Uh, so yeah, man, that's 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 how I, I got into the the whole sort of hip hop graph thing. And you thought it was going to be a basic podcast today? Yeah, you I'm fucking sorry. mad? Are you mad? We don't do basic round here. Uh, there's something telling about like just go back to the early conceptions of like not even graph, just general daubing of, of walls. Oh, yeah. I've never said daubing before, but I think... It was, you know, That's a good word. It's good. Daubing. daubing. It's the sort of thing you hear council say, don't yeah. you? But uh, it's, uh, it, it certainly wasn't of any uh, in integrity other than uh, Radio Caroline. For, or what was the other one? That's um, Tony Prince. Um, oh, Radio Luxembourg, Luxembourg maybe? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Music was dangerous back then. Yeah, Like, course. you had to be on a pirate boat... And yeah. put music out. You couldn't just... And pirate radios were also a thing. And everything orbited around the illegality of things. It made music edgy. And graph kind of was one and the same, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of mad to think that how... How it slowly... Did, it, it moved... Music moved in, the, in, the, in, a, in a way that can kind of conformed. But graph still retained that edginess... Um, arguably, maybe not up to now. To this point, we're we're slowly going through some levels of transition. Yeah, but, but it's true, isn't it? They, they they were one and the same, weren't they? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I think hip hop, when it comes to hip hop, graph is like the purest form. Like I said earlier, it's the, it's the purest form of hip hop because there's no metal, there's no oh, I've got uh, my last piece did uh, 
It's got three million hits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, now it kind of is that because all the writers, especially the new writers, are putting their stuff up on Insta, which is cool. Mm -hmm. You know, we really new writers would be doing the exact same thing. But there's no reward at the end. There's, there's no... You yeah. do you do what you do and you do it for yourself. Yeah. You do it for other writers maybe, but you do it for yourself mm. to, to, to get up. Uh, but yeah, man, Graf up until 1990 was, was, was a huge part of my life. I loved DJing and at that time I'd always buy hip hop as well from mm. a very young age. Not even... Even before hip hop, I'd always buy records. Like when I was young... My mum would always have the radio on. It mm. wasn't so much the TV. I don't really care about the TV, but the radio would always be be played. And before even hip hop, I'd buy David Bowie records. Mm. I'd buy Prince. I'd buy Michael Jackson. Mm. Like pop music was mm -hmm. good in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, even yeah. like Tears for Fears, uh, Human League. I still all listen these, to that stuff on Gary a Friday, Newman. Man. Do you know what I mean? All these yeah, like yeah. synth pop groups. I used to love that shit, yeah. man. I used to love that. Uh, Hip hop was all inclusive anyway. I mean, some of the more rarer groove soul and and you know drum and bass leans itself to a hell of a lot of it. It's it's actually one and in, its influences are very very vast, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. They kind of they kind of suck up the surrounding pop culture and reinterpret it. Mm. That's the best bit about hip hop for me was that it, you know even a remix of something that a hip hop remix is yeah. like yeah that's. That's hip hop essentially. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, it's yeah, commentary, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Fucking bonkers. Exactly. What did Smart. you used to write? Uh, I <laughs> listen. I'm not. I'm I not going. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to tell you my first tag because it was just too embarrassing. In fact, I'll tell you a true story. Right. So it's '86. Like I'm now going to secondary school, so I'm meeting other writers who go to my school, and I start to have a tag. First time I ever wrote, uh, wrote, wrote a tag or attempted to write a tag was on the Little Met going home. I caught an empty. I was like, right. Go, go, like, go. the pen I had was terrible. The nib was about this big. I remember I did it. And the first thing that I noticed was, damn, this is really hard to do because the tube's going like this. <laughs> and I looked at the tag and it was so pathetic. Like, I actually, like... Just dogged myself. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> that, it wasn't yeah, the one. Yeah, I was yeah. going to delete that. But I kept that it. So for the first year, 86 <laughs> to 87, I was just a proper toy. And by the way, like, obviously, I'm a DJ and I was nothing <laughs> compared to, like, there was a little year or two where I, I was up. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But compared to the legends that you have on this channel, I was nothing. Do you know what I mean? But this is, like, my story. So, like, yeah, first year, I was just a total toy, getting to know, like, the, the rules mm. uh, of Graf. Uh, I was a semi-decent writer, and then there was a kid who went to my school who I didn't even know wrote at the time, a writer called Hyde from Kilburn Park, yeah, Ar yeah. Irish kid. And uh, he introduced me to uh, a writer called Trace, a writer called Fair, who was another writer called Artist, who was a big writer and killer. Yeah. Him. Artist, he was, that was his brother. And Evil, Evil 87. Hold tight, Evil. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Uh, so, like, Evil was, like, a year younger than us. He was 11. And we uh, we were a year, year older. So we were 12. And, like, we'd just hang around Kilburn. We'd meet up literally every day, Kilburn Park. We'd go up Covent Garden, rack in, like... John Evil, he'd always have a, a rucksack with him and he was like the sickest racker. So like he'd be our guy and he was like a year younger. So like he got he away a little kind bit. Kind of got more, away with it a bit. More leniency. Yeah, so we used to do that. Like go out on missions, go Baker Street, grab an empty Watford or Uxbridge. I remember us going Watford, like battering the insides, like I think from Harrow till I think before we got to Moor Park, we had just a solidly empty walls, just like battering the insides. I remember pulling up at Moor Park and then the doors didn't open. I remember the, the, the driver announced, yeah, the doors won't be opening. Uh, British Transport Police have been called. There's been acts of vandalism on the train. And we were like, no! <laughs> no but that was us! So then we all had to bounce at the emergency exit. I remember just as we all came out, like, uh, BT's come... And then we had to walk. It took us what seemed to be like five hours. But obviously we couldn't go back to the tube mm. station. So we had to walk to Rickmansworth. Oh, shit. And that took us like, like yeah, yeah. 
five hours. That's a mish. Do you know what I mean? But then that was that was that was the life, man. You were born into the game. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, That's bonkers. But then, yeah, sadly, the day before my birthday, uh, November, November the 9th, I think, I remember going to school and seeing my man Drone, who was a writer from around here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the hardest kid in my school. And he had tears in his eye. And I was like, what's up? So, and he was like, yeah, yeah. John's died. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, man, he's died. I was like, I was with him two days ago. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, 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 no. Like, he's, he's, gone. He's, he's gone. And then I remember seeing like, like the newspaper, like the Evening Standard and his face was on it and it said like, like he died. And that was just like, like devastating to us because we had our friend who, who died mm -hmm. age 11. Do you know what I mean? Eleven uh, years old. Yeah, man. Died uh, with, from graph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, we used to do this thing at Kilburn where you go down and Kilburn Park, bro. Like I can't tell you, Kilburn Park, Warwick Avenue, that little segment of the Bakerloo. It was like the Bronx, like it was battered. Huh. I remember going Kilburn and seeing pieces, not just tags or throw ups, but pieces oh. on the other side. Oh, wow. Of, of yeah, the wall on the platform. Yeah, yeah. So that train used to pull in, we jump on, and on at Kilburn, opposite where the platform is, mm. there'd be like little kind of holes where they'd leave equipment, you know, train parts. I don't know, but you could cross the tracks, and go into the alcove. Go into the alcove. The train would pull in. You had a spray can. You could <laughs> get a dub up. You could batter it. So that's what we do, and we'd all take it in turns to do that. So. Someone would jump on, say there'd be like five of us, someone would jump on, hold the doors, people would be battering the insides, whoever was on the other mm -hmm. side would be doing their thing. You'd hold the doors for as long as possible mm -hmm. until the driver mm -hmm. physically got out of his carriage or announced, yeah, you know, right. happening, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, you'd get up and that'd be it. And, uh, yeah, with, with, with John, like... Uh, yeah, man, he, he he got dragged under, you know, which was which was which was like. Now this this subject has come up a couple of times, obviously with Steam and a whole handful mm. of others. Big up, shout Steam, out to you, Steam, yeah. man! Every time, yeah, shout I know out you're to a Steam. fan. I know that was yeah, a man. really big podcast for you. Obviously, because of the the the, the fault lines that lied within that crew is did such a such a seismic um, organization. But um, yeah, he mentioned the the evil um, story, and it's um. Again, just highlighting, super important, do not try that shit at home, people. You know what I mean? Listen, like, that could have been any of us, man. Yeah. That could have been any of us. And, like, looking back, it was so stupid, bruv. Mm. Like, I remember being with, with high, the evil face, uh, Trace and Fair, and it was raining outside. Mm. And we got down to Kilburn Park, and I saw my guy Hyde, like, rubbing the soles of his trainers on the floor. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, it's been raining outside. If we step on the tracks, we'll get electrocuted. So I'm just taking the water off. <laughs> you know, oh. and then we go and cross the tracks and it was the biggest buzz, but it was obviously like really, really silly thing to do. And we were, we were 12 years old. But I remember going home that day, man. And my mum obviously knew that this was my mate who mm. died, mm. you know. And I remember opening the door and she had a copy of the, the newspaper in her mm. hands and she was in tears. And she was like, I don't want this to happen to you. I don't want you to die. Your friend just died. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And then, yeah, I remember loads of us. We just gave up. We just gave up graph, because man. Because it was just, that was just enough of a trigger. Yeah, it's like, mm. we love hip hop and we love graph, but our mates just died. Do you know what I mean? So I remember, I think that even maybe that day, Oh. About 20 of us went down there. We all had our pens and everyone threw their pens mm. at the spot where, where sadly evil evil passed. And uh, yeah, like I stopped writing for a good like six or seven months. Loads of writers never even continued after, man. Really? But yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. saw that, that wave of remorse and and they, they, they just did not want to be a part of it anymore. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think out of respect as well, a lot yeah. of writers stopped writing for a while. Reality sink, sinks in, and unfortunately for the for the ones that fall, that's just a it's, a, it's bittersweet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But big shout out to TU, man, because at the time, mm. like me growing up, like like TU 147 crew, mm. like writers like Chico, Hold Tight, Fess, Hold Tight, Sersin, uh, obviously like Steam, mm. Krez, like those guys were just... Mm. Getting up next level with tags, pieces, dubs, and they were just they were just taking over, man. Um, you tell me, you said to me about a uh, you know, designated trains that were exclusively for TU. Yeah, you so, mentioned this. So, like I said, on. like like I, I was a writer. Like I said, I was nothing compared to to the kings that you have up here. But I only went yard like three times. Wembley Sheds, which was so easy to do <laughs> because you walk down 40 Ave, you go up the little thing and then there was a door which mm. always seemed to be open. Mm. Uh, and I think I did Neasden like once. But I remember when I did Neasden, like writers t who I was with were saying like, I think at Neasden at Ricky's, mm. there's trains you weren't allowed to do because they were reserved for TU. That's so good. Do you know what I mean? And I used to be like... Oh, Right, touching those trains, you know what I mean? <laughs> the I don't want no <laughs> Yeah, man. The formidable force. I mean, yeah. Steam was a, a, a boss of the, of that of the whole era. He, he was the general, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <sighs> well. It, it was exciting times. And looking back as well, like, Graf, and I think a lot of people don't really clock this, Graf moved forward so quickly. Mm. Like, if you check out the, the tags and the pieces from, like, 87 times, and then even a year later, 88. 100%. Like, the style's changed totally. Mm. We're less straight letters. It's more rounder stuff. Mm. The colours are getting better. People maybe have got access to slightly better paint. Mm. But because I was going to school, five days a week, I'd be on the Big Met. And I was seeing everything. And it was just like, oh, my oh God. My. I might add just add as well... Uh, for, for that lineage, check out rockinthecity.com because yeah, you start at the top and literally, it's, it's like you go from 87 to 88 yeah. and then next is yeah, a huge yeah, jump yeah, from 89 yeah, to 90. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the colours and contrasts and the yeah, yeah, just yeah. techniques are just yeah. upgrade yeah, real yeah, quick, yeah, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. No, totally, man. And uh, yeah, just seeing crews like We Rock Hard, like 87 <sighs> is when I really started to see like like... Robbo. But mm. one of the first tags, there was a Robbo tag, Robbo 484, I think, tag in Wembley, which was there from like really early, like 1985. And I used to look at this Robbo tag and I was like, what does this even say? And then I worked out, mm. it said Robbo. And I was like, mad. Mm. And then like, dudes like Drax, world mm. domination. And just seeing mm. next levels of things being battered. And then come summer of 88 was, was when the big Met was just crazy mm. you know my cast writers like that mm. and it was it was it was it was it was mad man uh, to have been there you were one lucky man yeah I swear. but because i wasn't writing then and, and i gave up because of what happened i still was go, going to school with graph writers i still loved graph i still doodle away uh but i'd have a camera mm. and i take photographs mm. So it's quite funny because a lot of the photographs... I mean, look, back in the day, we all used to trade photos, yeah. right? We all used to trade negatives and stuff. But I see loads of photographs that are up and I'm like, I took that photograph when I was 13. Going That's to school, hilarious. Do you know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. Because you were trading the negatives and then they get them developed and before you know it, you don't know what's yours yeah, or what's yeah, not yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you see it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Social media has a way of... It's like everything's a positive and a negative. Yeah. But one thing that's awesome is sharing the uh, the nostalgia and the stories, yeah. isn't it? Bruv, I remember being, going to school... Cold Crush Dukes, top to bottom, whole car I've comes that. in. That's cold. And like, that was the very first time I saw a top Mad. to the bottom whole car, like, and obviously foam cast. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, they had like the buildings and the characters. And I was like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember getting in that train. And as the first time I ever got on a train. You felt godlike, didn't you? Yeah, but what you got to remember <laughs> as well, when you get in a train that's got a, a top to bottom on it, the whole inside of the carriage is now dark. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a bit of a weird, <laughs> surreal feeling. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And and it's not what it looks like on the front because obviously everything's on reverse, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so you yeah, just get yeah. nothing but like mad colours, and you're thinking, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But then, uh, come sort of summer of '88, I started writing again. Did you? Yeah, yeah, man. I've got 
game drew, <laughs> drew me back in. So I started, <laughs> started writing again. I had a new tag, which I never got done for, so I'm not going to tell you what no. that was. Uh, and then, yeah, I man. love, I love that you did it again and you've got a name that we can't even mention. That is so good. <laughs> okay, come on, come uh, on. So, yeah, so then I started writing, got a bit better, started getting up more, and then... Uh, yeah, that all got put to the end. Uh, Saturday in January 1990, I went to Groove Records with my mate. Went and bought the records. I had a haircut before that. Hold tight. Went to the West End, bought my tunes, came back home. And then as I'm putting the keys through the door, my mum's opened the door. which so I thought was a bit strange. Mm. And I always remember the look on her face, man. It was like a a look of disgust, disappointment, and sadness. And I'd never seen my mum's face like this. And I remember, are you all right, mum? Like, what's, what's going on? And she was like, yeah, CID's just been at her, her house. Because come in, brought me up to my room. CID just come in. In the room? In my room, yeah. And I was like, because I had a box a briefcase where I'd have all my pens and stuff and I had a key in it so my mum and dad could never yeah. and that was smashed open I was like no, no you're in it. Yeah. they're doing me for this you know and then I clocked it was CID so CID don't care about graph no. so basically I was a stupid kid I got caught up in some dumb we'll say drugs related stuff and uh, yeah they done me for that and then next thing I know, they sentenced me uh, to go Felton. And I was in Felton for yeah, like three months. And this is in March 1990. So how old are you? I just turned 15. Well, oh, that's a bit so, like... so if you go Felton, I think the age is, is like 15. In, the, in those days, it was 15 to 21. So I remember yeah, going court and I remember my solicitor, lawyer, whatever... He was like, oh, this is your first offence. You know, you're going to be fine. You're going to mm. be fine. You're going to get off, blah, blah, blah. And I went to Marlborough Magistrates. I was 15 years old. And then, yeah, they go, right, guilty. Send them down. Next minute, I'm in the holding cells below thinking, what what the hell's going on? Like, this, Out of body, what the fuck am I yeah, doing here? Yeah, this is some surreal stuff. And then the lawyer comes. He's like, no, 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 no. It's going to be cool. You're going to be going to an open prison, whatever. I'm like, all right, cool. Hmm. So, hmm. Yeah, it's my first offence. I'm not yeah. going to be going Felton or somewhere horrible yeah. like that. So, yeah, I'm going to go open prison. That's fine. Cool. You know, so then, you know, they got you in cuffs or whatever. They put you in sort of like a van. It's hmm. 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 like a police van, but hmm. it's got these individual cells and everything's hmm. blacked out. And we start driving. I'm like, where are we going? Like, no one's told me anything. And then I clock. We're going towards South London. And then I clock, we're in Brixton. Mm. Like, what are we doing in Brixton? All roads lead to... So then they let you out, and then they put you in another holding cell where basically they get all the kids from South London who've been to youth court. So then I'm there. And the thing is, I'm there in a suit. Like, I'm, I've had to go to court. You're fresh out of court. So my mum's gone, you've got to good, make a good impression on the judge, Right? Yeah, yeah, cool. So I'm there in like a suit, like my 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 confirmation suit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> my Catholic days. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And obviously, everyone there isn't wearing a suit. They're wearing track suits or whatever. And I was there with my mate as well. So we're both my mate from Grove. So we're both standing out like sore thumbs. Oh man! And then I remember it's like 15 geezers in there. I'm 15, so the majority age was like 18 or 19. So I'm yeah. like a kid. I'm like, nah, man, this isn't good. Anyway, this kid walks in. Kid. He's probably about 19. Bruv, he robbed everyone in that cell. He was just going around and, like, I was clocking that he wasn't even, like, the biggest guy. Mm. But everyone, for whatever reason, seemed fearful of the, of, of this guy, you know? Yeah. And he comes up to me and he's like, yeah, give me, you know, give me your shit. Now, my thing was, at that time, in, in, in London, sort of between 87 and, and, and 90, like, it was a very violent time, like, street robberies and stuff. 
different you know, world, yeah. Yeah, there was no CCTV, so it, it was it was pretty violent. Uh, and people had tried to rob me in the past, and I was just one of those guys. Oh, stupidly, do you know what I mean? You, you can do whatever you want to me, but I'm not giving you my shit. Like, I remember one time I was on the Big Met, me and my mate tried to take his trainers, tried to take my watch. We weren't having it. We got rushed by like 16 guys for like three stops on the tube. Really? Do you know what I mean? So anyway, so this guy's like rubbing everyone, comes up to me, yeah, give me your shit. I was like, look, brother, I ain't got nothing. Goes through my pockets. They're like, right, your watch. Give me your watch. I was like, nah, I'm not giving you my watch. Like, give me your fucking watch, you fucking pussy, or blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, what am I going to do? Mm. Like, I'm a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy's big man. He's yeah, like, and you're already in the... Yeah, shit, so I give him, my, give him my watch and I'm just like shit man I've never been robbed that's my mum's watch my mum gave me that watch like this this ain't good you know? one, yeah. so anyway so then the screw comes in reads out a couple of names reads out my name he's like right you're out of here come so we go out and I'm like I can't grass with him because I'm not a grass <laughs> but I can't fight him because he's bigger than me Yeah. but I'm not leaving here without my watch yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So then I just didn't move. Screw, I remember he was some Scottish guy who was like, hey, come on, you fucking bastard. Come on, Straight out porridge, innit? It's yeah, like, yeah. Sort of shit. And I was like, oh, no, nah, I can't. I took my watch off and I've dropped it. Oh, okay. I go, I need to find my watch. And then that the kid who, who took it, he just threw it to me like that. And then I did something... Really fucking stupid. Uh-huh. Because I don't like bullies, bruv. Like, I don't like that shit, and I never like that shit. So I got my watch back, so I'm thinking, yeah, I'm getting out of here. You, man, are staying here. Mm. You know what I mean, you just tried to rob me. So I put my watch back on. Back on. I looked them in his eye, right, and I went, fucking pussy. <gasps> like that, uh, for those that are listening and not watching, <laughs> that was a, a hand gesture uh, followed by your fucking pussy hole. Yeah. So then I walked out and this guy's screaming at me, I'm going to fucking kill you, I'm going to kill you. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, ha, ha. so then I was like, he's staying here, I'm going wherever mm. they're sending me, right? Yeah. So then I'll get back on the, the lorry prison mm. van or whatever. And we're sitting there, whatever, you've got your handcuffs on. And uh, getting ready to go. And I just hear like the screaming that seems to be getting nearer and nearer. And it's the guy. He just robbed me. What the fuck? And I just hear these screams of, I'm going to cut you. I'm going to stab you up. I'm going to do this, blah, blah. And next thing I know, the geezer's on the fucking bus. He's on the van. And he's sitting there with you. And he's sitting behind me. And I'm like, nah, man. Like, I'm going to get killed. Like, because this guy's going wherever I'm going. Yeah, yeah. And it's... He's already breathing down your neck. Yeah. And from Brixton Police Station to Feltham, which is where we, we were going to, took about a two-hour drive. It's a yeah. long drive. And, bro, for two hours, that guy was just tell it, telling all the different ways he's going to kill me, he's going to torture me, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so then you. I remember arriving there thinking, this is not good, man. <laughs> this is not a good situation. Yeah. So then they process you, whatever, and then they put you in another room. And this guy, he's sitting opposite me and he's like, Still screaming. This is like four hours later. He's still screaming how he's going to kill me. He's going to do this to me. going to do all this stuff. And then I remember another guy who's sitting beside me. He's like, bruv, listen, don't worry. I'm like, what do you mean, don't worry? He's like, listen, how old are you? I'm, like, I'm 15. He goes, look at him. How old is he? I was like, I don't know, 19, 20. He's like, look, he's not going to be in your wing. You're not going to be at the same place because mm. they put it mm. by age group. Nice, okay. So then luckily his name was called and then... uh he went off to whatever his wing was and I went to my wing, which was, I think, 15, 17-year-olds. Uh, but then, yeah, man, that, that, that was like the best and worst thing that ever happened to me because when I came out of there, I realised how easy it is, one, to go to prison and get on the wrong side of the law and go down that path, mm. and two... Like, how easy it is to kill someone. Mm. Like, I met so many people in there that had just gotten into a fight and they punched someone and that person smacked their head on the corner and died. 
Mm, just things like that. Yeah, or, you know, stuff like that. I, I think about things like that a lot. I've never been a violent person. But, you know, when you see, when you hear stories of, like, people getting into fights and stuff, I often think to myself, you're tampering with death yeah, all, every yeah, time, yeah, yeah. innit? Yeah, but as a 15-year-old from, 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 from North West London, like I said, it would be violent times, so people would try and rob you and people would try and step to you. And being into hip-hop as well, mm. do you know what I mean? You, it comes with the territory a bit. Yeah. yeah uh, but I'd be, I'd, I'd always be ready to fight. I even like fighting. But the minute I came out of Feltham, I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. And then that's, that's how I got into DJing. But I was very lucky as well because at that time, Feltham was like was the most dangerous place you could be as a yeah, kid. Yeah, man. I remember that in the news and shit. That was a, a real thing. Yeah. Felton was like feared. Yeah, because you had the screws yeah. who'd be doing whatever, but also the bullying. The torment. Yeah. I think I think when I was there, there was 15 to 20 suicide attempts a week. <gasps> you know? Uh, and I remember by the time I got in... Luckily, I had a cell to myself as well, which was which was very lucky. So I very didn't have to share. lucky. Well, wow. uh, and I remember coming down the first day, sort of onto the landing, and you kind of meet everyone, and you're you're thinking that it's like because you've seen films in it of where, okay, this person's gone inside, and mm. then they've come out, and everyone's looking at them, everyone's clocking. Ubi, them. Ubi then kind of thing, yeah. And it was kind of like that. And I remember this guy called Brian, who was like running the wing. This guy must have been like six foot six, bruv. Like mountain of a guy. And he comes up to me. Uh, and I was like, nah. I'm trying to firm Hold it, it down. Hold it together. And he was like, yeah, you're from Wembley. I was like, yeah. He was like, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. Stop it. And I was like, and I, I just thought, yeah, I do know that person. I was like, yeah, I do. Yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're safe. You're safe. Goes any. You need anything in here? Come, come see me. And then me and him became mates. So, oh mate, blessings. So throughout my my time like in Feltham, it was to, it was totally cool. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it wasn't cool because I was there and I saw loads mm. of horrible stuff. Mm. That was What's the most horrible thing you saw? Uh, the bullying, man. Like it was, it was relentless. Like first of all, if you if you if you were in Feltham and you weren't from London, yeah, that's yeah. that's it, man. You were just a target. I remember seeing guys. I remember seeing meeting one guy who's from Australia, who was like at a rave, and he had like five pills on him, and then he got like a two year stretch for that. Two years, yeah, in yeah. Feltham, yeah, 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 Pil yeah. But this is like nineteen ninety, yeah. so and pills, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. you know, someone had died from it previously, mm. so they're trying to set an example. Uh yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't, I don't really want to say a load of horrible, violent shit that I saw. Mm. You can kind of like think of that yeah. for yourself. But the, the mental bullying and torture of people who were nice guys, but they were weak, and mm. people could see through that weakness. So I, I remember the thing that they, they do if you're being bullied, they make you sing lullabies. So lights will go out, I don't know, 10 o'clock or whatever. And then I remember the guy who was running the wing, who I was cool with, he didn't like some guy. It's this guy they called Fish, because he had a face like a fish. <laughs> and bruv, they'd make him sing the lyrics to la di da -di, Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh. Yeah? Yeah. So this guy made him, like, memorise these lyrics, mm. and he had to sing him to sleep every night. And if he forgot a lyric... If he so this poor kid and he's some like white kid he's not not into Australian. hip hop yeah yeah no he, he wasn't the Australian one this is some oh, other right. guy so he'd have to sing and you'd hear this poor guy like going lordy dolly we like to party we don't mm. and he's like louder sing it louder we don't cause trouble we don't love it and then this guy would just get the shit kicked out of him the next day like if he made it out of there alive I'd be surprised man wow so. Fuck. Yeah, like like the bullying in there was 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 terrible. And like I said, like kids would literally, they'd rather end their life yeah. than than be there. Of course, because you know? it's constant. Yeah, 
So so then I remember going out of there and I remember you got to, you know, they give you your stuff that you came in with or whatever. And I remember I had to sign whatever. And again, it was a Scottish screw. It was always Scottish screws. Mm. And I was like, right, see you later. And he was like, oh, we'll be seeing you soon. I was like, I ain't coming back here, bruv. He's yeah. like, ah, oh, that's what they all see. We'll see you in a month's time, you know. But when I left there, like I said earlier, mm. I thought, I'm just going to, like, I've seen so much negative stuff, you know, and this is mm. the, the bad path, you know. Mm. So I was kind of glad that I got nicked for doing some stupid shit as a 14-year-old, really. Yeah, rather than a 21-year-old. Rather than a 21-year-old where I'm now, I've got two years to do in Brixton. And you didn't expect it to have happened. That's the other thing as well. For, from accounts that you t tell of right now, you, you come from a nice family. Yeah. You, 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 there was no good reason for it to have nah. transpired or spiralled out of control. Yeah, exactly. In that sense, so... Yeah. Exactly. So when I came out, I was like... I love hip hop. I'm going to get decks. I'm going to be a DJ. I love Cash Money. I love Jazzy Jeff. Mm. You know, I used to love, obviously, like Westwood. You know, DJs like that Rampage. Do, like, you, do your Westwood impression. Go on. <laughs> no, no, no. Go on. Please no, do no, it. No, please. No, I'm begging, begging. I've got to go. The best shout, out to, shout out to Tip, man. Uh, so that's it. Mm. So then I spent a year saving up, saving mm. up. I'd do a paper round at five in the morning before mm. school. I did any odd job to get money together. Got three hundred and twenty pound together. Went down the Edgeware Road, which is where they used to sell the decks at the time. With my mum, bought two Sound Lab decks. Sound Lab, come and made, on! And a made to fade mixer. Now, if you ever had Sound Lab decks, they're the worst decks. In the world. Made to fade was kind of the mandatory kind of home <laughs> yeah. mixer, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So then I just taught myself how to mix. I didn't know anyone who was a DJ. Uh, and then I just make myself these mixtapes, which then at the time I was going college down the road from here in St. Charles College in Abbott Grove. I remember one day a kid was like, what are you listening to? I was like, oh, I've just got decks. You know, so you were listening to your own mix? Just listening to my own mix. Yeah, you know, I mean, maths or do whatever I've got, you know. My ear like this, I'm listening to music. He's like, oh, what's this? Oh, I did a mix. So he's listening to it. It's a kid called Darren. And he's like, bro, this is sick. He's like, C can I have a copy? He's like, I'll give you a fiver. I was like, all right. So then he gave me a blank tape on a fiver to dub him that copy. Mad. And then... I've got something here. <laughs> and, then, and then the girl, there's this girl called Sola, I think. She was sitting beside him. And then she, was, she wanted a copy... And then this next girl called Christine, she wanted a copy of that mix that I'd done. So then I thought yeah. to myself, hold on a second, stop giving me blank tapes and I'm mm. having to dub it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to just make a mixtape and then just mass produce that. So that's what I did. And then next, next thing I know, I sold 500 copies just in college in a round lab at Grove. This is like 1990, <sighs> 1992. You were, you were Q from Juice. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You, were, you were really doing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Straight but, out, I'm straight into the decks. Yeah, just no, like no, exactly. bossing it. But at the time, I used to go, Groove Records closed in October 91, and then they opened up in Covent Garden, a sound source, and two guys, Ben Dom and another guy actually called Rhythm Doctor, they ran the shop. Uh, but there used to be a guy called Fraser Cook, who... Shout out to Fraser, he's now gone on Fraser. to do huge things with Nike and stuff. But he was a guy who used to go over to New York a lot and he used to come back with mixtapes and he used to come back with like g the Pro Ray Double R mixtapes, uh, Kid Capri, I think early doo-wop. So I was listening to these guys. Also, shout out to Four Star General, to George. Hold tight, Four Star General. Because even in the 80s, I used to go and check him and he used to sell Red Alert. He had the, he had the bits. Radio he? show tapes. Mm. So you were getting this culture of hip-hop and of mixtape culture, the early mixtapes that were coming in and the radio shows. So you were able to hear these guys, mm. like, cutting up. And that just blew my mind, bro. Like, I was just like, this is what I want to do. Yeah, so then, where that is, for, for, for you to have discovered that when no one else really knew. Yeah, like, how would you? No. Unless you knew, and then, like, I knew some guys from Grove, and then they'd have people who would do the same thing, mm. So I remember, like, like, my mate Cuckoo, he had an early, like, Stretch of Bobito tape from, like, 1990. Mad. And we're like, wow, there's these guys on college radio playing, mm. like, mad hip-hop and stuff. 
So that's that's and obviously I was too young to DJ in clubs. I'm like 16, 17. Yeah. So I was like, right, mixtapes, mixtapes. So then I started selling them in college. And then I'd do like another volume. And then at this time, you know, we're like 17 years old. Kids would have parties, house parties around here. Mm. Like Harleston, Kensal Rise. So then I'd DJ at all these house parties. Which Tell was... the story that you said to me about the the rave. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cold. So, so at this time, getting into sort of 91, 92, like, like raving is huge. So you've got a large group of people who you who were into hip hop previously in the years before, but they now discover the ecstasy, you know, trips and, and and going to these raves. Now at that time, I was really obviously into hip hop, and apart from like smoking weed, drugs do drugs that. aren't yeah. cool. So I'm seeing all these guys doing pills and acting mad, and I'm like. That's not for me, man. Mm. Anyway, this kid who lived in Acton, he was like, you've got to come to a rave. You've got to come to a rave. You've got to experience it. Like, it's wicked. I was like, bruv, I don't like the music. You, man, do drugs. I don't do that. Mm. Like, it's not really for me. It's like, mm -hmm. no, no. So he called me up and he's like, there's one in Northwest. It's this group called Spiral Tribe. Right, right cool. Yeah. So literally, it was two streets away from here. And that was the first rave I went to. And I remember it was sick. Like, it was this huge house, which they just took over, and it was like a free party. Uh, and then it got raided by the police. Dogs, loads of vans come. They took the sound system away, arrested a few people. This is like one, two in the morning. Like, half an hour later, there's a new sound system. The party's back on. <laughs> and I remember that party then went on for three days. I left that party at eight, about eight in the morning. On the first night? On the first night. Right. And then, because I think that was a Sunday night, and then mm. Monday I, I had to go to college. So I went straight from that party here in Kensal Rise, just walked straight down Harrow Road, walked over to Harrow Road to Labrick Grove. <laughs> I went straight to college. I remember my mate saying to me, uh, like, how, how, how are you awake? Like, you don't, you're not tired. Mm. You've just been raving yeah. all night. And I was like, no, 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 no. no. Like, you know, I was drinking loads of water and stuff. My mate was like... Yeah, you know that water had like speed in it. <laughs> I was like, "What?" Because I didn't want to do speed. You're just like, doing water all night. So I'm just drinking this water. I just got bloody <laughs> speed in it. So come like three o'clock, where it's nearly time to go home. Like I just felt terrible, yeah. and I was like, "Right, like I've had my experience of rain." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know yeah. What I mean, but that was down the road from here, bro. Uh, but yeah, I. I uh, I had my my share of like going to raves or whatever, but it was it was all about hip hop and <clears throat> trying to push these mixtapes, mm. you know. And and push you did like we talk about you know social media content and stuff yeah. like of the of the new age, bro. Like you were one of the first people that I had ever um, uh, 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 before we were even friends. I even knew you. This was it was an it was an energy about what you were putting out, and you would find any opportunity to expose the mixtapes, whether it be advertisements. But you, I always remember you being so proficient at content creating. You were always, if there was a guest that was on the radio show, you would bring them in, and uh, or you'd go to a venue. I, I remember seeing at venues with dictaphones. You were doing it. Yeah, you'd get ID drops. You were always yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. afford. Yeah, totally, man. I mean, with the mixtapes. I'd listen to the New York DJs and mm. they'd have shout outs. Mm. So I was like, I need to have shout outs from all the mm -hmm. hip hop celebrities. And I didn't know them. How am I going to do this? So then I thought, journalists. They're the ones who do the interviews. Journalists. Yeah. So then I found out, and at that time I was working in Handspun Records. The whole time, Handspun Records. <clears throat> and I have to say, like, a special shout out to Peter Bond, Peebo the Pro, type who. P. Owned hand spun records. Mm. Originally it was a shop in Camden, then it moved to Notting Hill. That's it, yeah. Uh, and I remember this kid called Loco, this half Spanish, half Cuban kid who was a good friend of mine at the time. I was at college and he, he, he go, comes up to me and he's like, bro, he goes, there's a hip hop shop in, in Grove, like in Notting Hill, called Hand Spun Records. Like, we should go down there. You might be able to sell your mixtapes. Now, at that time, apart from around Grove, I was selling my mixtapes in maybe like four shops. Mm. Like all local. And the majority of university as well because you were 
in and about. Yeah, yeah, People yeah. followed you as, as in that. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and then he's, this guy's telling me about Handspun Records, so I go down there, meet this guy called Pete, and again, I'm like 17, you know, and he's like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm a mixtape DJ, and he's like, I don't even know if he knew what mixtapes were, he pr- probably did, mm-hmm. uh, and I played him my mixtape, and I was like, this is sick. I remember there was this Japanese couple in there, and they're, they're both like, this is sick, like, we both want a copy. And he bought like 10 copies of me straight away like that, like paid for, for up front. And at that time as a 17 year old, you know, got 50 pounds in your pocket. You're like, ooh. Milky bars on me. Yeah, I can, I can buy some <laughs> records. But he was really cool for me, to, uh, to me. And like, he opened a lot of doors and showed me a lot of love. And then when his shop moved from Notting Hill, it moved to Oxford Street for a little while. And then it yeah. moved to Darblay Street. That's and obviously, right. Darblay Street is the heart of Soho. It's where mm-hmm. all the big boys are. We were opposite Uptown Records. Black Market Records was, was down the road from Dark us. Dark and Cold was around. Dark and, well, Dark and Cold was above on. us. Oh. So we were in the basement of Dark and Cold. I know exactly where Yeah. Wow. Uh, and then he asked me to work in, in the record shop. Yo. Which, like, I was 19 at the time. And as a, as a kid, I was spending all my life in record shops. Because that's where you'd meet everyone, obviously. Get the rarity. That's where you get the rare vinyl that you needed and that I needed for the mixtapes. Because mm-hmm. for the mixtapes, again, I was following the Americans. The Americans always had the promos. They always had the exclusives. So that's what I needed to get. Okay, I clocked how to get shout-outs from famous rappers of the time mm-hmm. by going to journalists. So now I needed to get the exclusives. Okay, how do I get the exclusives? Okay. Are awesome. you taking notes out there? You better be taking fucking notes out there. This is some heavy shit. Carry so on. then, so then I'll be like, okay, so I'm noticing that if you hang around a record shop all day, sometimes they don't just get the release stuff. Sometimes they get promos. Mm. And if you're cool with a guy who works in the shop, he'll sell it to you. And then PR people would come in. This is mad. Who is uh, Noel Gallagher's missus? Or the um, was it the the other brother, Megan? Oh, um. it's one of the Gallagher's. Mm. Anyway, this is before they were together. So there's mm. this woman called Megan who used to come into the shop, I think, and she did promo. And at that time, Nas's first album was just about to come out, and she was like some posh white chick. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But she was doing promo for Nas. So then I was like, oh, yeah, I do these mixtapes, blah, blah, blah. Like, can you hook me up? And she was like, yeah, sure. So then I started to get free vinyl. The so sample then, versions yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah, 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 for the yeah. radio DJs. Yeah, right? so then I'd start hitting up all the record labels. And then at that time, from doing the mixtapes, and the mixtapes started to get bigger, then Westwood called me up. And again, I'm like, I'm, I'm a teenager. Hold on, Still, so wait a minute, wait a minute. So he calls you up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was that? What was that conversation about? It w- it was mad because I was having my son, I was having my Sunday lunch. Westwood calls up my home phone because on the on the mixtapes I didn't have a mobile phone then. Mobiles mm. were just coming out. I'd have my home telephone number. So Westwood called up, and then he was like, "Yeah, can I speak to DJ MK?" And my mum picked the phone up. <laughs> so my mum literally, all my family are Irish. So my my mum bless her. Said, that Tim Westwood's on the phone. <laughs> Who are you listening to on Capital? I'm like, what? I was like, hello? And it was Westwood. And he was like, yeah, man, like, I really love what you're doing with the mixtapes. You know, you're getting your stuff out on the streets. Like, I'd love, like, for me, maybe me to play some of it or maybe you to do me a mix for, for Capital. For, you know, for the rap Capital show. at the time was it, wasn't it? Now, at, was... at, at that time, like, I can't stress yeah. enough how huge that show was and what Westwood was doing, like, the parties that he'd do would be the best parties, like the Life to London stuff, mm-hmm. yeah, stuff at Dingwalls, then stuff at the Arches. It'd be crazy he because... He did Spats as well, was it? Spats? He did Spats, but Sp- Spats was earlier. So Spats right. is like... It's before my time. Right, 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 right. So right. Spats is probably like... I never went there, so don't quote me, but Spats is like 83, 84. It was a club on Oxford Street. Yeah, and they do yeah, like lunchtime yeah. sessions with uh, Westwood Family Quest Fingers. Yes, yeah. dudes, dudes like that. Dude, you can't underestimate the va- like what Westwood has brought to their game. You know what I mean? Insane levels. Yeah, in- insane levels. So the next thing I know, it's a Sunday, and I'm at the Houston Tower <laughs> where they did Capital, and I'm, I'm, I'm with Westwood, yeah, and, and Westwood's editing one of my mixes that I'd done on a cassette 
and he's editing it on a reel to reel. Reel to reel. Because what? there's no this is before mm. that, this is before computers and you could you know have logic or mm. Ableton and stuff where you could reverse swear words. Mm. And then he'd play my mix. And that was just the most incredible thing because his network of of of, of hip hop fans was was huge. So literally the next day was 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 just, you know, I get people hitting me up or whatever. Uh and then yeah. So yeah, that that was about ninety three, and then come ninety five, uh, I'd met Pete in ninety three, but come ninety five, that's when he asked me to work in Handspun Records, and we just moved to Darbley Street, and then that was just like amazing times because it's uh-huh. it's ninety five, so you've got some of the best hip hop coming out, and obviously we're based in Soho, so any artist who's coming over, they can be in, they're gonna come in. So I remember digging. 95, there's a guy, shout out to Fusion, who was uh, a journalist who used to do a column for Echoes. Mm. Uh, he did like the hip hop, the hip hop mm-hmm. page. I remember he brought Nas down. And like, we, we couldn't believe it. And where the shop was, if you look straight in front of you, you'd see stairs. So you'd see everyone who's walking down the stairs. And you see the, the, shop. The, the, the shadows and so the stairs. I saw this, 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 this guy, Fusion, <laughs> and I remember seeing him. And he was like this, and he clocked. Fusion like, and T Max. That's Fusion these and T Max. Exactly. Okay, yeah, Fusion and Fantasy. He, he comes in like this, and he's like smiling. And I'm like, all right, yeah, safe, that's Fusion. And I'm like, he looks a bit happy. And then boom, <laughs> behind him was Nas. I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> and then Nas was, he was really shy and mad, quiet. He's like, yo, he's got this really deep, deep, like, raspy voice. He's like, yo, kid, yo, what's up, man? And we're like, we're like like mind rough, like you've just dropped mind. like the sickest album like in hip hop like you're incredible like we've been listening to you since live at the barbecue zebrahead soundtrack like. mm-hmm. and then he was asking for uh for blunts it's like yo yo man yo yo man. you need to get some blunts man i remember me and pete, pete were like blunts <laughs> you don't want blunts bro if you want rizzlers like, make yourself a spliff <laughs> it's like word i say yeah yeah, yeah. it's like and then we said like if you want blunts there's one place in selfridges you could actually buy blunts from some cigar place. Did Four Star General, he, they, he had a stint of selling blunts and stuff like that, doesn't he? He, he could have. I, yeah, I don't remember maybe. that. I'm, I'm sure he did. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. he did. Uh, wow. But then, that's amazing. Yeah, but then I'm just meeting the entire hip-hop community. So anyone who's pressing up records, you know, so like, I don't know, like Rodney P. Yeah. Like, next thing he's coming down to the shop, yeah, yeah. P, like, I've grown up listening to yeah, you. Yeah, Money yeah, mad, yeah. like, this is incredible. And then, like, I remember Comanche Sly, Hijack, they were having a, a little comeback. And then, like, I'm talking to Comanche Sly, and then, and then more people, and then promoters are coming in to leave their flyers. And then they're clocking, I'm DJ MK, the guy who's doing mixtapes and, and, and doing mixes for Westwood. All happening, so bro. they're like, Rod, do you want to DJ at my thing? And mm. I'm like, hell yeah. So now I'm starting to do more clubs. And then I'm starting to sell, like, rather than selling in, like, 10 spots, I'm DJ. I'm oh, sorry, I'm selling my mixtapes, like, 30 spots, 40 spots. Then, because of the record shop, I'm meeting international people. So there's a guy called DJ Go, who you know, yeah. and he was in the shop, uh, and his parents were from Japan. So, mm. yeah, he, he was Japanese, so he could speak Japanese. My brother. Uh, shout out to Go. And I, remember, and I remember... What he used to do was, because he could speak Japanese, we'd get him to go out to Oxford Street, find crews of Japanese kids, and then bring them back to the shop. No way. Because obviously, if yeah. you're from Japan, you've got money, money, right? Of course, yeah. So then, so he brought in this group of kids or whatever. And it's like, 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 like 10 kids, and they're looking at all the records. It's like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I want that one. I want that one. And then... Something really weird happened. Like they all start looking at me. And they start going like this. They start bowing. And oh, they're talking amongst themselves. Mm-hmm. And next thing they're taking off their hats and they're giving me their hats. And I'm looking at Go going, What did you say? Bruv, what did you say? <laughs> like, these guys are acting a bit weird. Yeah. Like, what's happening? <laughs> and they're like, No, they've just found out you're DJ MK. They've got all of your mixtapes. What? And like, they want you to like sign your autograph on their and hats. And I'm like, Japan, like, how are my mixtapes going out to Japan? And then I found out that they were bootlegged. 
like heavily bootleg because they had a, a, you know Japan had a bit of a, a bootlegging culture or whatever. So I'm like, raw. So the next mixtape I made, I called it Bootlegged in Japan. Oh! And then bizarrely, I got my first big order of mixtapes from a Japanese distributors. Beautiful. Wow. And that was for like three grand or something. See, these, and these are the stories that come to mind when I think of the, uh, the, um, the notoriety of MK. Now, me coming in like 96, 97 into London... Mm. Deal Real was the thing. Deal Real mm. was the spot. But there was this... I remember fucking super sepia in my mind. Mm. Anyway, but I remember meeting you for the first time. Okay. And, and bro, I was just like, that's fucking okay, man. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because there was this... There was this real... You were London. You were the London DJ. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, ferociously London, in my mind. It was like... If if you if you were to epitomise anybody that was a DJ, I mean, uh, through Deal Real, I met mm. Shorty, of course, sure. and Pogo, and all these yeah, other yeah, characters. Yeah. But for me, because of your outward, the persona and the work rate, it was almost like yo, like it was almost like to meet MK respectfully. To meet MK meant that you were in the right place. Okay, you know what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, in yeah. London, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was the thing. It was it. And I can only relay it to my first experiences of meeting you and being part of the scene because it was almost like an OK sign if you got right, to, the, right. to the MK okay, okay. marker. Right, Do you know right, what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Deal real was it. There was a lot of things going on. A lot yeah. of, I remember Sinister and all Enforcers and yeah. all these characters, yeah. all yeah, these yeah, people yeah, yeah. just coming in and playing yeah, yeah, and, yeah. or being there. Yeah. Rodney was Roots Maneuver. Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah. Ty, rest in peace. Yeah, you know, all yeah. these. And you were part of that. Yeah, no, totally. So then in... October 1996, for whatever reason, I don't know what, but we had to leave that shop. And mm. I remember Pete saying, I think the rents have, uh, had, had gone up. Uh, so it was quite mad because we were in the basement of Dark and Cold, which is on Darbley Street. Mm. Now, above us were prostitutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the entire building was owned by an ex-prostitute who is now a madame right. who was like 70 years old. That's so, bad. so it was really funny yeah. because when it would be rent day, this posh little old woman who talked like this, and she'd come and go, <laughs> "Hello, hello, MK, how are you? Do you have the rent?" And then people would give her the rent, and then upstairs the dark and cold boys would, would, would give her the rent. But she was an ex prostitute who used to work in the building, and then did so good she bought the building. That. <laughs> And she was she was our landlady. But anyway, she put up the rent. It's amazing. So then we had to leave there. And then Pete was like, because he'd moved around and he was older than me. He was like my big brother. Mm. He was 10 years older than me. So I was like 19. I'm trying to age you here, Pete. Sorry, Pete. No, enough respect. But I was like 19. No. He was like, you know. Baby face. Tw 28, 29. And then he was like, no, we're going to open up another shop and it's not going to be in a basement. And he goes, furthermore, we're going I, I want it. you to... To, to come in with me yeah. do it with me I was like cool so we went round Soho seeing different shops and then he found a place in Knoll Street and we went to see it and it was an empty shop uh, and the guy who owned it was an Irish guy and obviously like all my family are Irish so me and him got on his name was John I remember and he was from Rickmansworth as well uh, and upstairs was an old belt factory and if you went upstairs, there was no roof. It was just full of, of, of pigeons and whatever and all the leftover stuff from the 60s or 70s, I don't know. But it was a proper mess. Wow. And then, and then the shop, which would then become Deal Real, was just totally empty. And then we had a basement downstairs. Uh, and then at that time, Tony, shout out to Tony. I'll type Tony, you Tony know, Vegas. Lovely guy. All these, all these, it's all tapestry coming together. Ab you absolutely see? hilarious guy, man. Like, so, so, so it's funny. Good, like always good dude. amazing company. Always. You, you can't have a bad night out with Tony. <laughs> so I knew Tony really well because I'd go to Bongo's mm. and, 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 and buy records of him. Uh, and I think Pete must have known who he was, but I don't think they knew each other that well. Anyway, I introduced, I, I'm pretty sure I introduced those two together. And then Pete was like, because Tony just got the sack from, from Bongo's. So he was like, we should get Tony in. I was like, hell yeah. 
because Handspun before Deal Real was kind of, I won't say it was like the hood spot for hip hop, but we'd get everyone. Do, mm. do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, drug dealers would come down regularly to spend 500 quid or whatever. Or the little geeky kids from Cambridge. From Sussex. Or, or from yeah. Sussex. Yeah. <laughs> would, would come in on a Saturday. Yeah. And that was our thing because in record shops before, and if you went to records, if you went to West End record shops, mm. you'll know this. You used to get the most shittiest wanker attitude. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like Groove Records wasn't like that, mm. but other other spots were. They'd look down at you. I remember that pretentiousness on behind the counter. Yeah. You used to scare the shit out of me. I yeah, yeah, yeah. And me and Pete, mm. and, and Pete always say this. He'd be like, "We're never doing that. We treat everyone fairly. I don't mm. care if you're buying one twelve for six pound fifty, if you're spending six hundred pound in here. Mm -hmm. We're going to treat everyone fairly on a level. So that's what we did, and that, that was sort of the ethos, I suppose, for Deal Real. So then. April 1997, uh, we opened up the shop. Uh, Tony's dad, rest in peace, he like helped build the whole thing. Yeah. I think Madda from Sound of Noise did the electrics. Madda, come on. Uh, Big up. Sound and, of Noise crew. And then, yeah, we opened up that shop. It was funny because the day before we opened on the Saturday, on the Friday night, we had a party and... I don't know if, if Tony said it on his thing, mm. but the whole shop nearly burnt down. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there was, like, literally, like, I think it was, like, I don't know, like, two in the morning, and we had a basement, right? So the party was upstairs where the mm. shop was, and then, obviously, downstairs in the basement. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but I think the light went out in the toilet, and rather than someone going and buying a new bulb, someone just had a candle oh, no. on the toilet, yeah, and then yeah. next thing... Like the smoke, like the whole place could have burnt down. <laughs> so I was like, oh, opening day. So rock star. Yeah, man. Still rock star. Did Scam come up with the name Deal Real? He did. I was there. Big I was, up Scam. I was, yeah, shout out to Scam. Like, uh, there is a Scam podcast, by the way. We'll yeah. yeah. To this there, there has to be, because like Scam's, Scam's contribution to hip hop is, 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 is next level yeah. with his involvement with graph obviously from mm. the beginning from literally when futura mm. came over and he peaced, was there yeah. he was there you know his him being in crew shout out tony tone rest in peace yeah. cuckoo victor mm -hmm. sir drew all those guys like there were certain graph writers right in the early days who were next level who were always one step ahead mm. And he was one of those first guys who you were like, you know, people doing, oh, check out my piece. No, look at Scam. Mm. Like, ridiculous. You know, and obviously guys like Rich and Rage. Mm. Guys <laughs> like, 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 like Bunny. No Limits. Yeah, State, of right, State of Art. Yeah. Obviously No Limits. Chrome Bonkers. Angels. Bonkers. Like, they were just doing some, some, some next level stuff. But, but yeah, Deal Real. And then that became the hub of hip hop. The hub of hip hop. So... Everyone would would come to the shop, whether you were Wu Tang yeah. who were in town doing a show, they'd pass by. All very, or... very overly casual. Yeah. It's just, what yeah, the yeah, fuck? yeah. And this ain't we're not talking about deal we're in Carnaby Street people, because I know no. we've got some we got some ages um uh, Okay, so, 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 stuff, so yeah, deal, the original... deal, deal Real in Carnaby Street was basically Pete sold the name. I mean, again, you'd have to get Pete's yeah, yeah, yeah. side of the story. Yeah, for sure. Uh but the way I saw it was he sold the name uh, Deal Real and then these guys opened up another another shop. Kept the name and the legacy They going. kept the name so, and the this, legacy. We're talking about the foundational. Yeah, the, the, but, 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 but to be honest, as a record shop, like I went in there, I think I sold some, some, some mixtapes in there. But as a record shop, I would never go there that much because they didn't have the records. I remember the week they, they, they opened up, one of the guys who owned it called me up. I was like, MK, I need your help. I was like, what's up? And he's like, can you tell me the distributors? And I was like, you're kidding me. You've opened up a rec record shop. You've just bought the name Deal Real. Like, you, you're asking me now, like, what, what are you guys up to? You know what I mean? So, but they were good because they kind of continued what we were doing with, with the Freestyle mm. Nights. I think Excalibur, actually, 
was the first person who went, who went to Pete and said, yeah. I want to have some type of freestyle That's thing. That's brilliant. Yeah, man. Doc, Doc Brown was in effect. All the, and then Kanye West and all sorts of people come from the set. So, you know, no, no discrediting the, sure. the, the, the journey. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 I feel yeah. you. Um, without that, those um, early inceptions of... There wasn't really in stores, was there? Not no, really like... No, no, no. I, I, can't, I can't think of, of, of... I mean, maybe Fat Beats yeah. in New York did yeah. in the stores, I think. Uh, I'm not saying Excalibur t took that idea from that, but he was the first guy, yeah. from what I remember, who approached Pete and was like, look, you know, I want to you know, just do, do some little freestyle thing. But also, we'd always have a mic, even in Handspun before Deal Real. So like... Just in case of trouble, you see. Yeah, like I remember, like, Mad Skills, 279. Shout out to 279. Really I remember good this Mad guy, Skills man. story, man. This Mad Skills stories is... Yeah. Yeah, so it's so it's ninety five. Oh, Mad Skills is he he won, I think, New Music Seminar, like freestyle mm. thing. He's now signed to Big Beat, he's got a sick album, you know, Q tips on it, large professors on it, he's got Mad. Nod Factor. Uh and I and two seven nine brought him over to do a show at Subterranea and asked us if we wanted to sponsor it, I think. So hold tight the number man as well. I know you yeah. mentioned that. So you need to get him in as well, man. You need to get him in. Hold tight. Another one of those rods that are going on. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh and at that time, I was doing mixes for him as well on on Choice. Mm -hmm. uh, Crazy. It's so funny because I remember, for some reason, I don't think I was talking to Westwood. Or we didn't have beef, but I wasn't really messing with him. And... It means you're doing something right when you've got them kind of... <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's and, kind of the thing. And I remember uh, my guy, Hakim... He's like, bro, because you need to do mixes for for, for two seven nine for a mm. show in Choice FM. Now at that time, his show was huge, huge, and he was kind of two seven nine and Westwood were, were kind of neck and neck. They were, they really were. With 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 the, with the promos and exclusives yeah. and stuff like that. So this guy Hakim goes, he goes, look, I'll speak to to, to numbers. You know, maybe you could do him a mix. Here's his number. Call him up. So I remember I called him up, and I'm a bit, I'm a bit gas now. I'm a, I'm. A, bit confident, do you know what I mean? So I'm like... <laughs> Look at MK, come on. So I'm like, yeah, it's DJ MK. Yeah, yeah, I'm the guy who does all the mix tapes. I'm the guy who's starting to do all the clubs and smashing it. And yeah, I've been doing mixes for Westwood, who's got the best show, blah, blah. And he did not give a shit, I remember. He was like, listen, if you want to do me mixes, you know I've got Cutmaster Swift who does me mixes, who's the DMC 1989 mm -hmm. world champion. Mm -hmm. And I was like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, so your mix has got to be as good as his. And I was like, okay. So then I do a mix for, for 279 for choice. And bruv, I'd spend two days on that 20-minute mix <laughs> because I just had his voice in the background going, yeah. you got to be as good as Cutmaster Swift. Yeah, 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 I was there yeah, when Cutmaster yeah, yeah, Swift yeah, yeah. won the DMC in 1989. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, this is my idol. God, big up, big up Cutmaster So he Swift. really pushed me to, yeah. to, to make like my mixtapes better. And he'd always like big me up. And me and Pete, and he used to like let us hang out on Choice FM. So for a couple of years, that would be kind of the normal thing. We'd finish off Deal Real or Handspun on a Friday night. And if I wasn't DJing, we'd just go up to Brixton. Numbers, well, Big Ted would open the door. He'd let That's us like in. Big Ted. And then, and then we'd just hang out there. And at that time, we were all quite heavy drinkers. So we must have been an absolute nightmare because we'd turn up drunk. Mm. And at Choice FM in those days, they'd have like... You know, the press photographs of all the famous mm. people who'd passed mm. up with the signatures and stuff. And, bruv, we'd try and take them off the wall and really? steal them. Yeah, we were... we were, but Reckless. Yeah. You know, we'd Worst go behavior. ahead drunk and stuff. But numbers kind of allowed us. Mm. And he'd let us... Because you were the next generation. And yeah. That energy and he was good. older and, and, and he saw, you know, he, maybe he saw something. So, yeah, shout out to Westwood and shout out to, to 279 because he, he really mm. like, helped me out, you know. And there's, there's certain people who... Help me out, so I got got to big them up, man. I mean, we're talking about London history right here, fuck's sake, and you know, big up everybody that was there during that whole period, mid nineties to late nineties, mm. so far as hip hop goes, mm. because there was the surgence of drum and bass and hip and and hardcore um, uh, dance music, and you know, all these other things that would come into play. But you know, there, there was a real um, stiff upper lip as far as, like, hip-hop was concerned, and then there'd be people like me coming in, and 360 physicals, yeah. and all these different, uh, you know what I mean? That, that would, Marco Magic, hold up, Marco Magic. Marco Magic. Magic. All day, all day. Uh, 
The lady's favourite. Lady's favourite, aka mm. Swordsman Marco. That was, <laughs> that was something I was like. Yeah, Swordsman Marco. For, if you're out there, Marco, you know what to do. Give Comment it, below. Give us, give us a shout. Give us a shout. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, I remember coming on your show. I remember being ever present and being a part of the thing. But the one, the one moment where I really felt like there was this. You started doing work with with Roots Maneuver yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. we we actually connected properly yeah. on the tour bus yeah, yeah, yeah. Ninja Tune I remember that bro you know yeah, yeah, out yeah. there we yeah, were going yeah, to yeah. different yeah. cities and towns and it was a whole new thing for me I was like Crazy. yo yeah. you know, I was so green like I was, that's kind of how old I was but it must have been about 1999 it, yeah it would have been so basically I met uh, Rodney through his manager Chuse Chuse ran Sound of Money Records that's and it. he had an office in the back of Sound Source Records in Covent Garden which previously was Groove Records <laughs> so I looked at him he was like this white guy ponytail I'm like you're not hip hop like, who are you and he was a lawyer music lawyer but he was mad cool and he just signed Roots Manoeuvre and he just had a record out called Where My Mind Is At amazing tune no next type of motion next type of motion that's it next there was type a Blessed Be The Manor as Bless well the yeah, they were the skits those, ones yes, but, but yeah 95 next type of motion sick tune but it's really slow. It's like and he was like, "Yo, you're doing you're doing Westwood tonight. Like, can you play this tune?" And I was like, "This is a sick tune, but everything else is kind of like 94 mm -hmm. BPM. It's mm -hmm. more head nods. Like, this is really slow." And I remember I played it, and it was the first time anyone played the Roots Maneuver mm -hmm. song, and that was on Westwood. And then in uh, before Deal Real opened, I was with Tony sanding the sign mm, mm, mm. of Deal Real and Rodney walked by he was like oh, yeah, 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 what's up yeah. I was like easy <laughs> and uh, obviously you know we were friends we knew each other and he had just tried to get a loan to do a record label from the Prince's Trust I think and I, I don't know how that went uh, and then he was like yeah do you want to go and have a drink so I said like, yeah cool so I bought him a Guinness had a little drink. And at that time, I just got signed to Profile Agency. Of course. With Serena. Hold tight, Serena. Yeah. With Serena. Yeah. And I remember she said to me, if you have an MC, we can put the price up a bit. Mm. You know, it's mm. more to offer. It's more of a show. So I remember saying to Rodney, yo, I've just been signed up to this Profile Agency. Like, do you want to MC for me? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because doing shows, he had... Where my mind, uh, next type of motion, and I think maybe where my mind is at. Those tunes were just kind of coming in, but he was like, "Yeah, cool." And then we did the hop. Mm. Actually, that was the first the time end. we did we right? did we did that, yeah. and the hop was run by a guy called Rich alongside with me, another guy called. Then flyers were Diablo. Some the circular flyers. Yeah, did the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we did like a little PA there, and that went good. And then we did Mudlums. Yeah, come on, hold tight, thing For come like on, Jack Cruise. Skinny and mm. Mongo and uh, Berry Crew. So we did that, like £50. And we're doing all these like £50 gigs. Mm. But we rehearsed, bro, and we took it seriously. Then he got signed to Ninja Tunes. And then we started doing shows for like £100. We'd go up to Scotland and do a show for £100. Wow. Or maybe £150, and it's going up to £200. Then he signed to Ninja. And then we started to do all these Ninja mm. Tune tours. Mm. I'd never been on tour in my life. And like you said, it just opened up a, a, a brand new world. Mm. So we did this UK Ninja Tune tour. There's like 16 of us on a tour bus. Mm. And they put us like second in the lineup. By the end of that tour, brother, we were on last. That's right, you were upgraded there. Because, every... because we did such a sick show. The momentum was following the tour bus, literally, wasn't it? Yeah. And then we'd do more shows. And then Rodney was... His his music was 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 uh, being exposed to a different audience, so you had sort of like the hardcore hip hop dudes uh. who'd who'd like what we were doing. Then the kind of left field, chin strokey coffee table, yeah, types. mo wax kind of mm. dudes like that, and then the ninja tune crew, which could be a whatever, mm. uh, and then yeah, we started going on European tours, touring touring you know America, touring Canada. Spreading the world, the word, like worldwide, and then started to go Australia, and I think a lot of people think now 
it's like the given thing. So if you're a new artist or whatever, mm. if you're popular, you do stuff like the forum. Yeah. Or you do Brixton Academy yeah. as a UK artist. So, yeah. you know, all these guys now will do that. Like, we were the first guys to do that. First bro. peoples to do it. Yeah. Like, we, th- do you remember? I think you were there as well. Mm. When we did Glastonbury, mm. and there was no other, hip, there was no yeah, hip hop yeah, yeah. in Glastonbury. Yeah, we were the yeah, first yeah, ones yeah, to yeah, come yeah, with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember? Yeah, yeah, ninety eight or yeah, ninety nine. Yeah, and that was with I think uh, Slum Village. That's right. Swollen members. Swollen members. That's right. I think Charlie too. And there was that break dance of that fell off the stage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> His head spun off the stage. Yeah, actually, and just dropped. Sounds dangerous. Yeah. Right? I think Scratch Purvis were there, maybe. Ah, uh, possibly. I remember Matt from Scratch being there. Yes, Scratch yeah, 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 yeah. Rob, yes, that's right. Matt they Smith. were there, bro. Like, f- f- just groundbreaking moments. That that that, that Roots Maneuver. You have it, hats, all hats off, standing ovation to you guys for like being there and just capturing that zeitgeist, the momentum that just pulled everything forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and. Um, like festivals, like before, I think there was the odd UK group who might have got signed and then they did some festivals, maybe mm. for a year, maybe for two. But we were the first guys to constantly get booked mm. and to make it the norm mm. for UK artists. Leamington Spa, for, Favish, for, Faversham and places like this, Faversham, wasn't it? Yeah. But it was really exciting because for me as a DJ, like there was this network of clubs in every city in the UK. So if you were going mm. to Leeds, you do the Faversham. Yeah. Like you just said, if you went to Brighton, there'd be four hip hop clubs, at least. Big every, up Concord. Every, yeah, Concord too. Yeah. You know, where you could, so every weekend. There was a scene. You'd be out doing that. Mm. And then I'd be doing the stuff with Rodney. And then I'd still be doing the mixtapes. Mm. So everything we're doing is just pushing out. And we don't really understand or see the full extent of what we're doing no. and how it's spreading world, worldwide. So I'm not really clocking that my mixtapes, you know, there's people in South America who have got them somehow. There's people in, in New York. There's, mm. You know what I mean? So it just got bigger and bigger. So it's like really, really like an ex- oh, exciting you literally, time. As you were talking, you literally, my head went back to some crazy recesses of oh, feeling, yeah. of, of that feeling. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's some crazy, that feel. I remember when Serena first signed me to, to the agency yeah. and I went, I just went to that place. Right. I just went to that place okay, in okay, my head okay, where okay, I was okay, like, okay. yo, that was so sick. Yeah. It was, a, it was um, a, f- a free fall of opportunity, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it opened the world because for me, I'd never, outside of hip-hop, I'd never left the country. Mm. The first time I left the country was in 1995, where I was selling a lot of mixtapes, mainly in the UK, and I met this guy from France. And again, like, I'm I'm in the record shop, some random guy from France, from Paris, comes in. He hangs out for three hours with, with like, me. I think Super T was mm. there, Pete, obviously. Mm. I'll tell Super T. And... Like three hours later, we're best mates, mm. and he's gone. Yeah, he goes. You should come to Paris. These mixtapes are wicked. And he's like, I, uh, I'm really cool with this guy called Cut Killer, <laughs> who's uh, basically doing what you're doing. They he's did, doing like yeah. like mixtapes. He's like, I'm going, I'm going to Paris next week. Like, you can stay with me and my family. Why don't you come out to Paris? So I was like, Okay, let's go to Paris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the next thing, I'm in Paris. I've bought like. I think I bought 100 mixtapes with me, right? Uh, so much hustle. So so, so he, he takes me to the first record shop. Bruv, they buy them all. They buy all 100 tapes that day, cash. I'm there, like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And the next thing, like, I'm on the radio stations there, hooked up with one of the heads of, like, Virgin, this guy called LBR. And he's like, oh, I'm DJing tonight the uh, fashion party. You want to come down? I'm like, yeah. He's mm. like, yes, because I think it's, I think Jenny Jackson would be there, loads of models. So I was like, cool. So then I'm in the DJ booth with him and he's like, do you want to DJ for a bit? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, I'm clocking like, that's Kate Moss. Like, Kate Moss is there. Oh my God, that's Janet Jackson. Because we are in Paris, you understand. Yeah. This is the one of the, you know. I'm like 19, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So those times were, 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 were 
crazy, man. You did Incredible a mixtape with, with Cut Killer as well, didn't you? I didn't. Dude, I remember... Well, you definitely did one with Shorty. He nearly got me killed. Who? Cut Killer? Well, he didn't get me killed, but... The maddest story, bro. So, at that time in Paris, they used to have, like, their equivalent of Subterranea. Yeah. Which was kind of just like a moody club in Paris. I remember my brethren goes... Oh, I was staying with him and he's like, oh, you know, tonight we go to the party. So I was like, cool. And I'd already met Cut Killer at that time. I'd been to his house. We had a little cut. He was mad cool. Mm. And I think we then went to a radio station together and he's mad cool. And we had a lot of mutual respect. Mm. I gave him my mixtape. He gave me his, whatever. He's like, yeah, you're dope. Yeah, you're dope. Cool. So then we go to this club. And uh, like it's there. Like it's all, all. It's a bit moody. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I'm with Cut Killer. And there's a guy. Who's a dwarf? He's a dwarf, bro. Okay. He's this high. Yeah. Black guy with dreads. Yeah. He's angry. And like, he basically starts walking. I hear this little stuff in French. He's got a gun. Pulls out the gun. Obviously has beef with my man. Who's standing beside me. What? And next thing it all kicks off like... We go right in. I won't say what happened next... Because it's probably best not to, but yeah, that was like my That's first, one of my first mad. experiences in Paris. Because Paris in those times, bruv, like you did, you did not mess around. Like the Paris guys were the safest. Yeah, they'd yeah, show yeah. you love, but they're but if you if you there's fights in in the, in the shopping malls for breakdancing and shit, yeah, stabbings like, and shit. Yeah, like, like I remember this. Like like I kind of noticed that who people who were I consider just normal sort of sane people also had a collection of very dangerous weapons yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, like, you, you did not mess Ooh. around when you go Paris. Paris would have muck but, about. But Paris was, like, the first city outside of London, outside of the UK, that, that really Braced showed it. me love. And I'd go there. There was a time I'd go there, like, every three months. I'd go there with my bridger and who'd be doing all the bootlegs. Yeah, I remember you doing this. I do. So This became folklore. This yeah. was, yeah, yeah, this was yeah. folklore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only way you could even actually get the full 360 of your activities was based on the mixtapes that you had. Yeah. There's a freestyle by Sanso. There's there's this collaboration going on here, a remix. How did you get that? Yeah, you know, there's yeah, all these yeah. shout outs and it became like this. Yeah, this, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But one thing I always had in my head from when I first started doing mixtapes in my bedroom when no one really cared as sort of a 16, 7 year old was to, to play the music I loved and to play UK music. Mm. So on that very first mixtape, I had Blade just dropped his yeah, album. Yeah, so Blade. Like a, that Blade and MC Mello tune. Yeah. I had, I can't remember what London Posse tune was out at the time, mm. uh, but I put that on it and that was important for me. And then my mates who I thought were sick, guys like Super T, mm. you know, uh, mm. I'd want them to be on the mixtape. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's always what I try and do. Not, not, not from a perspective of ice wolf. pick. I remember hearing ice, pick. and also there was another. Was it Big Quam? Big, Big Quam, Quam, yeah, yeah. Blind, blind side records. Yeah, yeah. All these people I remember being on your mixtapes. No, Big Quam wasn't on my mixtape. You sure? Yeah, positive, hundred percent. He, I, th- I don't know if he was American, but he had like an American. No, he had an American. He had accent. American. Were you accent. against that? Were you not into that? Well, look, I mean, at the time, it was just a given. Like if you rapped. You rapped in an American accent. Mm. That that's just the way it was. Mm. So all the sort of early hip hop that we were hearing was was had an American accent, and it didn't seem weird. But then, I suppose as you get older, you kind of think, "Why are we doing it?" Yeah, this, <laughs> this is a bit weird. And I always remember like hearing Bionic. Mm, Cockney, so yes, 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 yes. And I'm like, bro, your voice sounds sick. Mm. And at that time, people were kind of laying off the American accent a bit, so you could kind of hear both. Mm. But then that led the path of this is really stupid. Mm. So f- from then on, I was like, Amazing if you're coming you with that Yankee yeah. twang, it's not really, it's not really cutting it, you know. Yeah. So, like a lot of the guys who'd be on my tapes would be. I don't know, like Brotherhood. Yes. Do you know what I mean? So, shout out to Billy Spiff, yeah. Shylock. Yes. And they'd be spitting. I'll tell Dexter. In, in, yeah, Dexter, come All on. Day. They'd, be, they'd be spitting in an English accent. Mm. Fallacy. Mm. Oh, you know, English accent. Skinny, Skinny. man. <laughs> yeah. English accent. Roots Maneuver. And it made it all right. 
Yeah. It's like it's the way it should be. Yeah, because that's how we, we we talk to each other. And it's actually unthinkable now when you consider the landscape of grime and drill. And But without those informative moments of like, hold on, what are we doing? You wouldn't have that. Yeah. It no, wouldn't definitely. be there. It, it would have never reached the level it, it would have. It always would have stayed in that square box because... It couldn't. You couldn't export it really mm. to Americans because no. they'd obviously think you're American maybe for a second mm. and go, okay, you're okay, and then you're from London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you're you doing talking like that then? Yeah. It'd be like if me and you were rappers and we just pull on an Australian accent <laughs> and go, all right, mate. Yeah, it's weird, right? Like, why am I doing an Australian accent? Yeah. I'm not yeah. Australian. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so luckily, homage. Oh, yes, yeah, so luckily, you know, we went down the route of of, of yeah. spitting in a in a UK accent UK and getting rid of that American twang. And it led to all these things, and we'll get into the Dizzy Rascal thing in a bit. But mm. but um, I, I want to kind of get, circle a little bit more in the Shorty relationship and the Kiss FM thing, yeah. and and you know your your transition into radio, yeah, and yeah, yeah. because that uh, again, like Wednesday nights, no Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, th- Thursday, Thursday. Thursday nights. That's right. Um. Yeah, because I think funk, so it's Funky Dread. Um, that was the that was the Dread show on a Monday. I and mean, now I'm going back into like the recess. I can't even remember. You've got better memory yeah. than me. But um, yeah, I do remember dialing in. And yeah, you guys, you and Shorty, big up Shorty. Uh, you know, this, Shout and it's been going for so long. Yeah, so basically. History in the making. Yeah. It's still, it's happening. It's still, it's still popping. Yeah, it's mad because Kiss is a station I used to listen to as a pirate. Now, where I lived in Northwest London, you couldn't get Kiss too tough. You could just about get it. But I remember listening to Max and Dave. Shout out yes, to Max and Dave. Yes, Max and Dave. And, and, and listening to, to Richie Rich. And mm. Richie Rich always played like a lot of UK stuff. Like I remember hearing Cookie Crew, mm. Females. First person Banging, I ever yeah. heard play it. Uh, so Kiss was then, you know, the biggest pirate. So in 1990, they changed the laws. Choice FM got a license. Jazz FM got a license. Kiss FM got a license. So then that was just like, wow. Yeah. Rather than just, we just have Westwood before. Mm. So Westwood was on Capitol. He had the best show. But now Dave Pierce. Oh, sorry. And Dave Pierce. Oh, like Westwood Dave always Pierce. had the crown. But, he, but, he but was, Dave yeah. Pierce was doing his thing Way with, with thing. Radio London yeah. and, and then GLR. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, he'd have Juice Crew. Come mm. up, he'd have Public Enemy. He created yeah, 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 legendary yeah. Uh, radio. Uh, but Kiss was always a huge station that I'd listen to and... I'd love. Uh, so I got to know Dave through his brother. His brother, Norris, went to my college. And, you know, he was both in tape hop and then, you know, mm. he said, oh, my brother's Davey J. And I was like, wow. Mad. So then I got to know Dave. And then Dave let me do the odd mix for him on, on Kiss. So I was slyly, because my thing was like, they're not going to give me a job as like a 20 year old mm. kid. Mm. But if I can do everyone mixes, I'm going to be on choice. Mm. Kiss was always a station that I really respected. And I'd go up there, like I said, from like 96 onwards, I'd go up there to do special you know, guest mixes or whatever. I remember the first time I went up there, Holloway Road, uh, Max and Dave were doing their show there, Killer Priest. That's right, because that's where Kiss was. That's that where was Kiss was. That's the original, Holloway Road, just outside yeah, of High yeah, the, the, the original uh, le- London legal crew. venue. I remember, I remember going there and it's like, People were smoking weed in the studio. Mm. Like, it was just a total different vibe. I'm like, wow, this is really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I can get with this. Yeah. <laughs> so then I think in about... So then Shorty took over for Max and Dave, Shorty and Ted. Mm. They took over in 99. And obviously I knew Shorty really well mm. because of the hop. So when we started the hop, uh, my mate Rich who had the idea to do it and he was the one who was pushing the money into it. To it. He was like, yo, yeah, you can do it, but we need someone else. Mm. Who else do you know who's, who's you know, up and coming? I was like, this guy, Shorty yeah, Blitz, yeah, yeah. incredible DJ. So then Shorty, me and Shorty did the hop together for like four years. And then obviously, yeah, he's a hip hop DJ, I'm a hip hop DJ. Mm. We'd be at similar things. Yeah, yeah. He worked at Release the Groove. Mm. And then I was at Handspun Records. And then he went on to do Kiss. So then he'd invite me up. Like when we had It's mm. All Live come up, we all went up to Kiss and did like a Live to Eleven thing. So Kiss was almost like a familiar place for me mm. by now. And then there was a guy who won the DMCs, I think 2003, called DJ Scully. Yeah, hold that Scully. And he was a guy who used to buy my mixtapes back in the day. as like a 14, 15-year-old mm-hmm. kid. 
And then I remember him getting decks and him going, oh, I made a mixtape. Can I send it to you? And hearing this guy's mixtape and thinking, oh, this guy's might be quite Got good. Yeah. And then he went on to win DMCs. And as a result of that, Kiss gave him a show. Now, at that time, I was doing Itch FM. Shout out to, uh, we won't mention your names, but you know who you are. So 2000, Itch FM starts. Now, I have a history of doing previous pirate radio stations that mm. never really popped off. They're in some dodgy estate, some crack house. Mm. You go there, you do three or four shows. You wouldn't even know yeah. if anyone had, was listening. So then we stopped doing the hop in the end of 1999. Mm. And uh, these guys who, who were doing itch before itch had started would, would come to the hop. I remember them, them coming to, to, to Rich, I think, saying... We want to do a club night. Mm -hmm. My mate Rich went, listen, if you want to lose money, yeah, go, your go and do a club night. <laughs> yeah. So then they were like, all right, we won't do that. We'll do a radio station. I remember them calling me up. I'm going, yeah, we really want you to do a show like you're doing your thing, obviously. We want you to do a show. The station's going to be huge. It's going to be called Itch FM. And I was like, nah, no way. I'm not doing pirate radio. I've mm. had my, my, my run of, of that. I'm not interested. And then these guys yeah. kept on going, nah, you don't understand. This is... We, and they were serious, bro. Mm -hmm. They had their business head on. Yeah, they were way ahead of the curve. Yeah. yeah. So then started doing Itch with A-Side. Yeah, yeah. And then we had the show with No Name. Yeah. Which... Bonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was, which was so, so much fun. Shout out to A-Side, man. Mm. Uh, because we we do that and we used to have a show Friday night from, I think, nine till midnight. And then again, it was in North London. So we'd have like, my family up. Mm -hmm. uh, and he used to do a section called the break section. And... Uh, Aside's knowledge of music is, is incredible. Yeah. So then he'd have a little 20 minutes. We'd just be playing all yeah. these sick breaks and stuff like that. And then me and him would just be like just, just cracking jokes throughout the entire thing. But he'd normally do the most of the presenting side. At that time when I did mixes or any radio stuff before, I wouldn't have to talk. Mm. If I did have to talk as a little interview, mm -hmm. I'd never really feel comfortable because... It's just something I didn't really like like to do. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. real reason. The hands do the talking, you yeah, understand. Yeah, exactly. But then there'd be times when A-Side wouldn't be there. So I'd have to do this three-hour radio show by myself. And I'd obviously have to present. Mm. So Itch FM really gave me... The training of, ground. The training ground. Mm. And obviously, it's Rago. You're in a, you're, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but now I'm a bit. The yeah. doors could be raided at any yeah. time. But... Dangerous, yeah, see? But, but it taught me how to be a good presenter. Mm. And then in 2003, DJ Scully hits me up and he's like, yo, uh, I'm doing a Christmas special. Like, do you want to come down and, 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 and like do me a mix? He goes, you can record it at Kiss. I was like, wow. Mm. Okay, I don't have to pre-record it. I can do it at the Kiss studio mm -hmm. as well. So I went down to Kiss. And I remember, bruv, we both DJed the night before at the Junction in oh, Cambridge. Cambridge, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, I chose not to get drunk that night. He did. And I remember, so I'm doing this. So he comes in and we were recording the show as live. But basically he let me, what was probably going to be half an hour mix, he let me do the entire thing because he was hung over. And he was sort of saying on the mic, oh yeah, Christmas special, we were both, we smashed the party last night. I'm a bit worse for wear, so I'm just going to let my man MK, yeah, take the reins for a bit. Yo. So I was like... Cool, bro. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna keep on so I'm mixing. So then, yeah, I did that show, and then about four months later, someone, one of the producers from Finally, Kiss, yeah. called me up, and they were like, "Yeah, Scully's ill or something. Like, can you cover his show?" I was like, "What? Yeah, bro, this is incredible. This is legal radio. Like, I love itch, but I've been doing this now for like three or four years." I've kind of hit the glass ceiling of yeah. pirate radio. And you just knew there was a transition waiting. Yeah, it had to happen. And then I did. I, I stood in for him once. And then I got a call next week. He's still not coming in. Two weeks. That two weeks then turned into six weeks. So I'd then done six weeks on Kiss. And it was, it was, it was good. Yeah. You know? So then I'm thinking, okay, that's it. I've done my six weeks mm -hmm. on Kiss. De Scully's going to come back. And yeah. then that's it. So then Scully came back. And they were like, look, we really like what you were doing. Can you stay and do the show together? And obviously me and him, remember, we'd known mm. each other since mm. he was 15. 15. He used to buy yeah, mixtapes yeah. of me. Mm. So he was like, yeah, cool. 
And I was like, is that cool with you? And I was like, yeah, it's wicked. Like, cool, let's do it. So we did the show together. I don't know how long it was. I think it was less than a year, but like maybe eight months into it, mm. he turned around to me one day and he was just like, you know what, my heart's my heart's not in this anymore, man. I was like, really? He's like, my heart's not in the DJing thing. I'm going to do something totally different. And I'm going to leave and you can wow. take over. And then that was it. And then I had my own radio show on Kiss, which would be live every Thursday night at nine o'clock. Mm. And, you know, you've got like roughly a quarter of a million live listeners there. Mm. So you're there in your room and you're thinking, I was right, one of them. I've yeah, got like was. four Wembley stadiums yeah. locked into me. This is incredible. Yeah. And Kiss was so cool. They trusted their DJ so much. I could play whatever... I wanted and even to this day Kiss have never given me a playlist of you have to play this or these are the songs we want you to mm. push you totally do your own thing and then I wanted to do the same thing that I was doing with the mixtapes mm. I wanted UK artists or you, whoever was good to come in mm. and do the sick freestyles and play those tunes that maybe weren't getting played and then nearly 18 years later still doing it which is which so sick. Yeah, which which is cool. Been a long time you've been on that radio station. Yeah, man. How's that work with nowadays with the Dizzy aspect? Because, you know, you are full-time. I'm like, trying to get you on the show, respectfully and understandably, you're dealing with a superstar and and you're having to deal with different levels of moving parts, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, how, yeah. how do you do the radio station and do the, the Dizzy shows? It's bonkers. It's bonkers. It's bonkers. Your, your legacy is crazy. Uh, well, one thing I found that was quite hard was in 2001, me and Rodney went to Australia for the first time. Mm. Uh, and then from 2004, I've been to Australia every year at least once, sometimes even twice. I told you. Even sometimes three times a year. Mad. Going out to Australia and to New Zealand uh, to DJ. So obviously, if you, you know, you could be gone for a month. So... What I'd do is I'd I'd do pre-records. Mm. You know, would I mean? you do them in this hotel? Or would you actually do them before you left? No, no, I'd do them before I'd left. I'd do them wow. before I'd leave. So that could be sometimes like two weeks worth. Three oh weeks. yeah, 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 or three or four weeks, yeah. or maybe I think they'd allow you to do two weeks mm. worth of pre-records, and then luckily it would always be in, in December mm. or January because mm. that's course, their yeah. summer. So there's not a lot of new music out in January. Mm. So then maybe I'd do a, a best of the year. Mm. Or something, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of get me through. You see how hard the, the hustle is so fucking real with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's bonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you turned around some big money over these mixtapes things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, but what's, let's get to the grassroots here. Seismic amounts of money. Like nowadays when we're talking about independent labels, yeah. you were doing that before. Of course. You know what I want to say quickly? I want to say shout out to Blade mm. because... Yeah, all day. Uh, I remember being in Groove Records and hearing one of Blade's first 12s. I can't even remember, Mind of an Ordinary Citizen or something like that. I remember going to buy it and going to Ben, who worked there, kind of have that tune. And he was like, this is the last tune. It's his copy. And then he was like, but you can buy it from that guy over there. I'm like, what? Who's that guy? Mm. He's like, that's Blade. That's his record. I was like, but he's selling them independently. Mm. He's pressed them up. And I think subconsciously it was Blade. Yeah who gave me that mind state mm. to be like, you can be independent. You don't have to rely on anyone. I might just add as well, check out 521, the channel, Blade's thing, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, uh, without question, he's just yeah, no, he's solid it, for man. decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he kind of gave me the inspiration mm. to, to do mm. to do uh, that that kind of thing. But yeah, with with with, with, with the travelling and, and all the Dizzy stuff, like I hooked up with Dizzy in 2007. Uh and at that time, I'd heard Grime through an ex-girlfriend mm. in 2003. I'd heard about Grime before. I just thought it was a bunch of geezers shouting. Mm -hmm. I didn't respect it. And then I heard I Love You. Mm. And I was like, what the hell is this? Like, this guy's voice sounds so sick. He's cutting through. Like, what mm. is this beat? This is like some futuristic next level Hip hop, yeah. Timberland meets Premier meets yeah, 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 some yeah, 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 yeah. wizard or something. Do you know what I mean? So. And his voice was just like it was. It for me, it re, it was reminiscent of Bionic. Yeah, 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 totally. He cut through just like that. So then, I remember going to the studio, 
and meeting him. And I'm thinking, and I'm I'm a bit older than than, mm. than Diz, so I think at the time Dizzy was maybe like 22. So I remember what I was like when I was 22. So I'm thinking I'm going to meet this arrogant kid. Nicest dude. Who, and I meet this guy and he's just like the most intelligent, yeah. nicest guy. Calculated. Who is so focused. Yeah. I'd never met anyone who was that focused. And I saw the team that he had around him who were all mad safe. And they were all, you know, just they had the same mission. So then we started doing shows. First show I did with him was in Amsterdam. And then, yeah, well, just, you know, MTV Awards, just whatever, just anything you can think of. And then, yeah, still do that to the present day. And it's just been, yeah, it's just a mad journey, bro. Because it's like, when, when I was doing shows before, yeah, you get the five-star hotels, you get... But this was like the next level. Like, Dizzy was that UK artist. Like I said, now it's the norm. Yeah. But he was the really one... The bar was set. To, you know, to have an independent record label and to have like whatever he had, five or six number ones on his own label, smashing it. And then that's the first time for Rolling With Dill. It's not just doing big shows like selling at Brixton Academy. We're doing stadium shows. Like we did one run of Australia and New Zealand with uh, Kelvin Harris, shout out to Kelvin. Mm. Lily Allen was a bunch of other people. And it was just stadiums. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, like. <laughs> Benchmark set. Yeah. Benchmark set, man. Yeah. Like he, everything by numbers, by numbers. Mm. He was... Meeting the right people. Mm. Mercury Award nominated to a winning it. It's like if you were to create an ideal, you know, journey, mm, mm, mm. it was almost like he just nailed it. Yeah, yeah, killed it. Killed even, it. The, even, the, even the sample. What was the sample he used? Fix Up Look Sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Was the sample. Uh, big Beat, Billy Sky. Big yeah. Like, so, I remember Fusion turning around to me and goes, I've just heard the next Dizzy single. They ain't gonna be ready for this. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. And when that came through, it's like, yeah. Yo, yeah, he yeah. used the break. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was incredible, man. Incredible. So, but yeah, now shout out to, to Dizzy and the crew. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, still out there. We still go out there, smash the festivals. And I think on, on on a live level, like he can't he can't be touched no. because he's probably the only artist that has that catalogue yeah. from yeah. the old gram stuff from the early 2000s into mm. the first album, into into everything else. The only other person I think was is Streets. No, 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 not even. Not Bro, even. He doesn't yes, have the catalogue. And, and also when I say... When, uh, yeah, when, that when album, I, that's right, you're absolutely right. No, no, disrespect, one album. Yeah, no disrespect to Mike, do you know what I mean? Definitely done his thing. But the range yeah. of hits, so you can have like... Plus three albums, more. Yeah, so, so something like Bonkers, mm. like... Everyone mm. knows that tune. That's part of the, the British Institute mm. almost. <laughs> but then you can have, you know, we'll do this tune like Stop That, which is just like some grimy, essentially underground shit. Or then he can have a song like Dance With Me, Calvin Harris, Hands In The Air. Yeah, yeah. It transcends do, do you know what I mean? eras. Yeah, it transcends eras and emotions and vibe, all done with top-notch skill. That must be a pleasure as a DJ. To it is. To... It's, it's, it's a total pleasure because, like, I only ever wanted to work with people I really respected. And obviously, like, Rodney, you know, uh, genius in his field. But, but Dizzy just... He doesn't have days off. He, like I said, he's the most focused person I know. And, and to work with him is, is a pleasure. And I think we have, like, a mutual respect for each other. And, yeah, he's a lovely guy, man. And like I said, he's one of my favourite rappers. Mm. Like, I am a fan. Mm -hmm. Before I worked with him, I was a fan. Mm. And, I, and I still am. Mm -hmm. You know? Like I say, him and Cass is Dead are, like, my two favourite MCs. Big up Cass is Dead. Good people again, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, dreams can come true, yeah, for baby. real. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And Peter Pan, man. You're looking well, bro. Thank you, thank you. You're yeah. looking well. Cool, man. He goes to show you that, you know, Traveling and being around like-minded creative people, you know. Yeah, just do you know years. what it is? It's it, it's probably not having the stress of doing a job that I hate. 
But you hustled that again, just to relay like they, all of our, all of our, we we get passed on this this secondhand information of yeah. how you really did it. And if you plug that into new media as well, yeah, yeah, you're off yeah. to the races. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you really set the yeah, hustle. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also, like, it's important, man. Like, just little things, and it sounds corny, but to eat good and to drink lots of water, <laughs> and mm. you know what I mean. And that's how you stay healthy. Otherwise, you know, there's lots of people who are our age who are a mess right now, <laughs> yeah. and they're learning the hard way. Yeah. So yeah, look after yourselves. Look after baby. yourself for real. Yeah, you know. A bit of health and advice, definitely. So what's the future? Future, uh, just keep on... Dare I ask? Yeah, I mean, just keep on doing what I love doing. Uh, follow me on the socials and yeah. you'll see for yourself. Yeah. So on Insta, the real DJMK and everything else is DJMK. There's some guy in America, man, who's got DJMK and he wants me to give him, I think, a thousand dollars or something, which I refuse to do. So yeah, that's why I'm not DJMK on, on, uh, on Insta. This is DJMK. Yes, sir. End of. Yeah, the original. That's right. You get me? You get me. The yeah. lineage is explained. We've just explained over the course of a podcast why this is the bona fide article right here. Yes, sir. My brother. Pleasure. MK inside wicked, the... Man. Thank you. Wicked, wicked. No, thank you. Yo. Peace. It was so perfect. Yeah, you know what it is? Killer Killer Podcast. We're only doing it like this. Is like it? and subscribe. Exactly. Like and subscribe. Yeah, you don't want to be anywhere else. Where would you want to be? Why would you? All right. Mm. Well, like it was out of fashion, okay? Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Be lucky, people. Enjoy your day. Peace. Been rabbit. That's what happens when you're a superstar.